Hello, librarians. I am Chris Vicari of Union Square and Company, and I welcome you on this lovely day to our A Book for Every Reader webinar, sponsored today by Soho Press, W.W. W. Norton and Company, Workman Publishing, and Union Square and Publishing, formerly known as Sterling Publishing. Thanks for spending time with us today. We have four delightful authors for you to meet over the next 45 minutes or so, but before we get to them, and to our moderator for the day. First, I want to tell you that over the course of the panel, should you have questions for our authors, please, pretty please, write them in the Q&A box instead of the chat. Write them in the Q&A box, please, so that they are easier for us to find and gather. A selection of the Q&A will be read after the last author has spoken. Next, at approximately 1.15 Eastern Standard Time, after our authors have dazzled you, I and my fellow library marketing colleagues will return to the screen for a brief title preview because we want you to know about some of our books coming soon in 2022. And finally, we expect to go until about 1.45 today, but if anyone needs to leave early, don't you fret because we will be recording the session and we'll send out the link to everyone as soon as it is ready. Lastly, a good old reminder to turn off cell phones, email, anything that might make noise. We thank you, and I will see you a little bit later, but now time for me to hand the reins over to our moderator for the day. She joins us from the beautiful Hunterdon County Library in the western section of the great state of New Jersey, where she works as the assistant library director and also head of acquisitions, bringing in the books and authors that you'll want to read and meet when she's not at the library. She is reading or taking long walks and talking to the wild birds. Please say hello to our friend and moderator. Jennifer Winberry. Thank you, Chris. And thanks for having me today. I'm really excited to be here and to share these great titles with everyone. So let's get started. Um, first up, Eli Craner. Eli is the author of Don't Know Tough, which won the Peter Lovesy First Crime Novel Contest. Publishers Weekly has called Eli's prose evocative and Kirk has said Don't Know Tough is the first novel bristling, bristling with dangerous energy. Eli played quarterback at every level, peewee to professional, and then coached high school football for five years. These days, he has traded in a pigskin for a laptop, and he writes from Arkansas, where he lives with his wife and children. His fiction has won the Greensboro Review's Robert Watson Literary Prize and has been a runner-up for the Missouri Review's Miller Prize. Eli also writes a nationally syndicated sports column, Athletic Support, and his craft column, Shop Talk, appears monthly at Crime Reads. Don't Know Tough will be published by Soho Press on March 8th. Um, he's gotten some great quotes from S.A. Cosby, Ace Atkins, and William Boyle, among others. Welcome, Eli. Hey, Jennifer. Thank you uh, so much for having me um, today, and thanks to all the publishers for, for getting me involved in this. Um, I'm really excited to be here, and she did a great job there of my introduction. And what I'd like to do is, is just give you guys, I was just going to read um, this, this quick summary of Don't Know Tough. So <clears throat> Friday night lights gone dark with Southern Gothic. Eli Craner delivers a powerful noir that will appeal to fans of Wally Cash and Megan Abbott. In Denton, Arkansas, the fate of the high school football team rests on the shoulders of Billy Lowe, a volatile but talented running back. Billy comes from an extremely troubled home, a trailer park where he's terrorized by his unstable mother's abusive boyfriend. Billy takes out his anger on the field, but when his savagery crosses a line, he faces suspension. Without Billy Lowe, the Denton Pirates can kiss their playoff bid goodbye, but the head coach, Trent Powers, who just moved from California with his wife and two children for this job, has more than just his paycheck riding on Billy's bad behavior. As a born-again Christian, Trent feels a divine calling to save Billy, save him from his circumstances, and save his soul. Then Billy's abuser is found murdered in the Lowe family trailer, and all evidence points towards Billy. Now nothing can stop an explosive chain of violence that could tear the whole town apart on the eve of the playoffs. So... From my background, a little bit on that introduction that you got, uh, tying it in with this, I'm actually coming to you guys live from a high school English classroom in Russellville, Arkansas. Uh, so I teach now. I did coach high school football um, 
for five years. I played in high school, college, and then my professional uh, quarterbacking was done actually in Sweden, uh, which is a whole nother story. Um, but this book, the whole idea for this book um, came from those five years when I was when I was coaching. I was actually a head football coach um, at the age of 26, which is way too young, probably. Uh, it definitely was too young for me. I think I got the job because of my playing background, you know, and, and I got it. And I did, in Arkansas, being a head coach, is it, there's a weight that comes with it. You know, it's a lot like being a, a mayor or being a sheriff or something. And, and I just wasn't ready. And what I really wasn't ready for um, the most was was the lives of these kids. You know, we were right kind of at the foothills of the Ozarks in a small town just up the road uh, from here. And this, I, I live and teach now in my hometown. And um, and I was just floored, you know, by these kids and when I would take them home and when I would you know, have to practice and then we weren't very good. So, so much of this story comes from a place that was, that was really deep for me. Um, in many ways, you know, I was, I was the coach in this story. And then the players, you know, that are in the book come from all different, you know, my experiences and playing days. Um, but it was funny because I got out of coaching after I did two years as that head coach and then I had been in football for 20 years. So it was when I was nine, I played my first season of tackle football. And then I got out of coaching when I was 29. And that was about five years ago. And that's when I started trying to write seriously. So I was this weird combination of, um, I was the quarterback at our university. And then I was also an English literature major. Uh, and I think I was like, it was a small school. You know, I think I was like the only male, like maybe senior English lit major um, at the whole school. And so <laughs> it was a funny combination, but I always kind of had this, you know, where I was writing and reading. And so when I got out of football, I decided I really wanted to try to write seriously. And I went at it kind of like I had this big void of time where um, I had been going to practices and doing all this, you know, staying late Friday night. So it was funny, like, you know, the writing life takes a lot of time, but my wife has always been like, you know, she loves it compared to the life of a high school football coach. So I, I tried to, to tackle football with that same discipline. And I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I actually wrote this story. Um, it started as a short story, which Jennifer mentioned in my introduction. Uh, it won the, the Greensboro Review Robert Watson Literary Prize. And, um, and I wrote the story. I, I was one year out of coaching and I wrote it during my lunch break. And that story, it was like, like right at a thousand words. Um, and it ended up being the, almost the exact first chapter um, of this book. And there's a line and, and it says, the opening line of the book says, still feel the burn on my neck. Told coach it was a ringworm this morning when he picked me up, but it ain't. And it was that line that came to me like while I was, while I was eating my peanut butter and jelly sandwich at lunch. And then it was just like this voice, you know, this voice that I had heard on the field, this voice that I had heard, um, driving these kids home after practice and it just flowed, you know, it just shot out of me to make this short story, which, which is the first chapter of Don't Know Tough. Um, and from there, you know, I, I was really trying, I was following the old school method of, I was writing short stories, like really, I'd, I'd read somewhere that Ray Bradbury said, you got to write a million words before you're a writer, you know, so it was like, I wasn't even going to try and, and tackle a novel. Um, or, or, or expect anything, you know, until I hit my million words, like I kept a little notebook with it. But then Don't Know Tough, that was my first like actual print publication in the Greensboro Review. And so I went in trying to make it into a novel. And, um, and, and it was, it ended up being that was about four or five years ago. And I had all, you know, ups and downs, rejection stories or whatever, but then Soho came along, and it was the coolest, the coolest connection, you know, that that Peter Lovesey, uh, this this guy all the way across the pond could read this this book, you know, with a gritty kind of grit lit crime novel, um, and he ended up, you know, choosing this book, which I've got to thank Peter Lovesey because that guy, um, it was his 50th year anniversary, and Soho asked him, you know, if they wanted to 
um, have a big party, throw a big gala, you know, for this 50th year anniversary. And he said no. And the reason was is because he started his whole career by winning a contest in the Times. Um, and the strange serendipity of that whole thing is that he was 34 when the book was published. He was a teacher. And out of nowhere, you know, he, he chooses this book. So I, I've been so thankful that he didn't throw that party uh, because I've just loved getting this book out. And I love the, the theme of this whole thing today, a book for every reader, um, because it's what I'm doing. I'm, at, I'm an English teacher and boys, are, it's just so hard to get boys to read, even like young, you know, fourth grade. I feel like they've, they've even stopped reading younger and younger. And, and this book has a wide cast of characters and it's got a wide, you know, it, it's told from a lot of different point of views, but, but that voice that I quoted that line and that's, that's the main character, Billy Lowe. And he has about half, half of half the story to himself. And so I've always thought, you know, as librarians or school teachers, that this is a book, you know, that for, for, for guys that, that maybe not want to read and, um, that it would it would be you know a good a good fit for for them, so that's really um, what I'm thinking, and I I think you know some similar work to this um, for don't know tough I know David Joy writes kind of in that same vein um, I know like I mentioned Wiley Cash Megan Abbott like four of the maybe not the same tone but definitely like the sports side of things, like how she can weave that sub subculture into a broader narrative. Um, and that's the thing I, I like about Don't Know Tough too is, you know, there's one football scene. So I've heard a lot of people be like, oh, I don't want to, you know, tackle a football book, but there's one scene at a game and I don't even think it mentions the scoreboard, you know? So a lot of the guys that I cut my teeth on are like Flannery O'Connor, um, Larry Brown, uh, Harry Cruz, you know, the, the Southern authors, um, this would all fall kind of right into that that same that same wheelhouse in terms of of writers that are out there. Wally Cash, David Joy, those guys. So I think that's it. Thank you guys again for having me. Hey, thank you, Eli. I don't know, tough does sound perfect um, for all the Southern Gothic fans, and I think you mentioned all the big ones. Um, next, we'd like to welcome Elodie Harper. She's coming to us from London. Elodie is a journalist and prize-winning writer. She's currently a research reporter and presenter at ITV News and has worked as a producer for Channel 4 News. Elodie studied, studied Latin poetry both in the original and in translation as part of her English literature degree at Oxford, instilling a lifelong interest in the ancient world. The Wolf Den is the first in a trilogy of novels about the lives of women in ancient Pompeii. It was a number one Sunday Times bestseller and has received a lot of love in the UK being called utterly spellbinding, gripping, mesmerizing. The Wolf Den will be published in the US on March 28th by Union Square and Company Publishing, formerly Sterling. Welcome Elodie and thank you for joining us um, today or tonight, if it were for you. <laughs> yes, thank you. It's the evening here in um, London, England. Thank you so much for that introduction, Jennifer, and hi to everyone. It's lovely to be here. Before I tell you a bit about my book, The Wolf Den, what I'd like to do is take you to a place which is what inspired the book and where it's set. I don't know if anyone here has actually been to the site of Pompeii, but it's an extraordinary place. When Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD, it preserved the town and it didn't choose what to preserve. Unlike other sites, you know, where the most valuable things got preserved, the thing that's extraordinary about Pompeii is it preserved the lives of ordinary people, people about whom we would probably know nothing um, if it weren't for the fact that the eruption had captured aspects of their lives. And for me, one of the most extraordinary and poignant places is the town brothel, the Lupana. And Lupana in Latin actually means wolf den, um, which is where the title of the book comes from, the wolf den. Um, and uh, a prostitute uh, in, or sex worker in ancient Rome in Latin um, was a lupa or a she-wolf. So that's where the title comes from. The thing about the uh, brothel, it's the only surviving brothel from the ancient world. It's like the hit 
spot on the tourist trail um, in Pompeii today. But the thing that really struck me when I visited and maybe struck you if you have uh, seen it, uh, I mean, firstly, it's extraordinarily well preserved. You go in, there's this narrow corridor, these five cells. Uh, there are erotic frescoes on the walls of women entertaining clients. Um, it's, it's an incredibly beautiful um, place, um, but also really disturbing. And um, one of the things that's disturbing about it actually is how it's talked about uh, today. So it's kind of seen as a bit of a joke. Um, and, you know, I felt like the women were still being objectified now. They had very hard lives uh, back then. And I wanted to look at their lives in a different way and sort of imagine what their lives would have been like aside from the work that they had to do at the brothel. So that's really where it came to. So, you know, people go to the brothel nowadays to kind of admire the beautiful artwork um, and just, you know, kind of intrigued by the fact that it is, is a brothel. You can still see all the beds in the little tiny rooms. I mean, it's kind of amazing. But they kind of, it feels like they're laughing at the women and kind of laughing at the whole idea of it. And I wanted to write a book where the women were laughing back, where they had something to say for themselves. Um, so that's really where it came from. And also, as Jennifer mentioned, you know, I've, I've studied Latin literature for a lot of my life. And a lot of what remains to us is the elite writings, uh, the, the writings of elite um, male authors and the way that they talk about women or enslaved people or freed people. Um, you know, it can be quite demeaning. So again, I wanted to sort of reverse the viewpoint and imagine what life might have been actually like. And, you know, Pompeii is a great place to start with this because we have actual graffiti that people wrote. Um, you know, some of it's very funny. They talk about their love affairs, uh, their arguments. Sometimes the stuff's very poignant, um, but, you know, actual real voices. And we have real voices from the women in the brothel. We actually know their names. Um, so there's Victoria, who describes herself as Victoria Victrix, Victoria the Conqueress. So in my book, she became a very kind of forceful character. We have Berenice, we have Cress. Um, so to talk about the book itself, I wanted to think about the five women who would have lived and worked in these five cells, what their lives were like, aside from the fact that they had to do sex work, what was the rest of their lives like, their hopes, their dreams, their ambitions. So I took five very different people. Um, because in the Roman world, people came to slavery through very different routes. So the main character, Amara, who we identify with, she's Greek. And she was sold into her fam uh, into um, slavery when her family um, became destitute, which was something that did happen in the ancient world. And I gave her that background partly because she's kind of our eyes and ears through the story and Pompeii is unfamiliar to her. And she also used to be free because I wanted people to be able to identify with her, you know, very readily. There's Dido, who was kidnapped into slavery from North Africa. Again, this was really common. Um, there's Cressa, who was born into slavery, and Victoria, who was what was known in the Latin um, world as a rubbish dump baby. People were like just discarded and picked up and then used as in part of the enslaved workforce. Um, and we've also got Berenice, who was traded over from Egypt. And they're very, very different personalities. Dido is very sensitive. She's very traumatized from having been kidnapped. Victoria is um, really sort of forceful and vivacious and funny. Um, Berenice has this like ridiculously silly um, infatuation with a guy. So she's always pining over her boyfriend. Cressa has quite a tragic story. She's slightly older um, and she lost um, her child who was sold into slavery. But the main character is Amara. So Amara has been sold into slavery by her family. Um, she's a well-educated woman, the daughter of a doctor. Uh, she wants to be free again. She's furious. She's angry. She's got a real passion for life. Um, she, uh, her nemesis is Felix, the pimp, the guy who owns the brothel. And so this book is really Amara's attempt to get out of the brothel. How does she become free? How does she gain her freedom? So, you know, there were various routes that people might uh, gain their freedom then. But obviously, um, as a sex worker, the main um, quest for her is to find a wealthy patron. So I mentioned that as well, because I wouldn't want people to think that all the activity just takes place in the brothel. You know, she goes, what I want you to do in the book is take us right through the society of Pompeii. So she entertains at very wealthy houses. Slight spoiler there, sorry, but just so you get a sense of where we're going. Um, and so, yeah, that that is kind of the trajectory of, of her story is, is Amara's um, adventure um, to, to gain her freedom. Um, 
because in writing the book, I wanted it to read like an adventure story while also acknowledging just how difficult um, women's lives were then, and particularly women's lives um, in sort of the sex trade in which in those days, you know, you were enslaved into it. So I was very careful not to write anything graphic uh, because I didn't want to sort of exploit it in that way. Um, so it's really about the psychological impact of that. Uh, and also in the book, you know, if you like your Roman history, there are some famous Roman characters who pop up um, as well, which I hope will amuse people. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the, the basis um, of the book. Uh, thinking, sorry, I'm, <laughs> sudden distraction because I just saw how much time I've got left. So I didn't know how long, much longer I could bore you all with Pompeii. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was an absolute joy to write. I did go to Pompeii to research it. It's part of a trilogy, you know, Amara's the main character, her relationship with her fellow women, what happens to them all, that's part of the trilogy. Also this, this relationship that she has with Felix. And in like my remaining um, couple of minutes, I suppose I would talk about that too. So the book deals with themes about what is it, what is love? Is it possible really to love a very wealthy patron? The whole kind of pretty woman story from that um, film, what does it really mean if an absolutely penniless woman is trying to have a relationship with a very wealthy man? Is that ever, is that ever gonna be a genuine relationship? So there's all of that going on. There's relationships she has with her fellow women, but actually one of the central um, themes of the book and the central relationship and what's kind of a propulsive force through the trilogy is her um, nemesis, is Felix. And I tried to do something different with Felix too. So his name's also um, in the brothel. I'm not gonna say what the graffiti says about Felix because that would be a bit of a spoiler, um, but he was a real person too. Uh, and I wanted, so initially when we meet Felix, we think he's a total monster, uh, he's abusive, he's violent, but then I wanted to think about what, what is abuse really, you know, that dynamic of abusive people. They're not always monstrous, sometimes they're charming. And one of the things that Amara learns through the course of the book is that actually her and Felix have some similarities. And if she's going to be free, will she have to become more like him? And is part of their hatred that they have for one another um, also to do with the fact that they have this kind of kinship because of similarities in their lives. So I hope that um, you might enjoy it. As Jennifer mentioned, it's been a bestseller here in the UK and I really hope that readers in the US enjoy it as well. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you, Elodie. Um, and it sounds like a fascinating story and I'm sure readers are going to be very excited that it's a trilogy and they will be able to read on with what happens to these women. Um, and now please welcome Bill Rohrbach. Bill is the author of the five previous books of fiction, including the Kirkus Prize finalist, The Remedy for Love, the best-selling Life Among Giants, and the Flannery O'Connor award-winning collection, Big Bend. His memoir in Nature, Temple Stream, won the Maine Literary Award in nonfiction. Among other honors, Bill received a fellowship from the National Endowment of the Arts, held the William H. P. Jenks Chair in Contemporary American Letters at the College of the Holy Cross, in Worcester, Massachusetts. His craft book, Writing Life Stories, has been in print for 25 years, and his writing has appeared in many national publications, including Harper's and the New York Times Magazine. He lives in Maine with his family, and his latest novel, Lucky Tur Turtle, will be published by Algonquin Books on April 26th, and it has been receiving a lot of love from authors such as Lily King, Andrea Barrett, and Jonathan Evison. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thanks. Uh, hi, everybody uh, who I can't see, uh, who all over the world and all over the country. It's so that's that's a good thing about Zoom, right? Right? We're not. It's not totally horrible. Almost totally, but not totally. Um, anyway, hi. Yeah, my book is Lucky Turtle. And um, I, uh, I, I loved hearing about LED's uh, uh, I, I loved Pompeii and Ercolano, a visit there. And I always wanted to end a novel just by having a volcano go off and just ending everything. You wouldn't have to tie up any loose ends. Um, but uh, the, uh, and just watching those images from Tonga the last few days, pretty uh, dramatic. So I'm very excited to, to read, uh, read that book. And um, my book got 
started, I think, in my imagination, uh, some, yeah, it's probably 10 years ago, my uh, aunt, my mother was one of eight, she had died. Um, so I started talking with her uh, sister, Patsy, fairly frequently. She kind of took over the Sunday call. And uh, one day she said, I am going to Montana with uh, Bessie. And Bessie was one of the older sisters. Patsy and Reba, my mom, were the youngest. And they were going, uh, so Patsy, age 80, and uh, Bessie, age 90, were going to uh, uh, go to Montana and get, uh, sorry, Uncle Bill, Sorry, <laughs> I'm just being technologically uh, astute here. Anyway, um, they, they went to Montana to get Uncle Bill out of the nursing home where he hadn't spoken for two years. He had uh, Alzheimer's or some kind of dementia and he'd had some uh, very violent episodes and then stopped speaking. He had been a minister in Montana. And um, so the so these women, 80 and 90, flew out and rented a car in Denver, drove up to Montana, picked Billy, as they called him, up at the uh, nursing home and took him to, uh, drove him up to Glacier National Park. He was in the back seat and uh, would, didn't say a word. And as they came over the going to the Sun Road and the view opened up, uh, uh, they, uh, Patsy was moved to sing, so she started singing a hymn from their childhood, and uh, his uh, and uh, Bessie sang along with her. And then from the back seat, Bill's voice, his lovely voice, and the harmonies they'd sung when they were young, came out, and he sang. So they sang for the several days driving around Montana, just the three of them singing and singing. He never did speak again, but uh, the music had reached him. Um, Montana was a feature of my youth, my uh, high school days. Um, uh, Eli, my brother was a, a football star and my mother once said to me, well, Bill, your brother was a football star and you weren't much of an athlete, so you had to become a star hippie. And um, I, of course, took offense at that. But anyway, she found, she, she, uh, I, I would. I had a way of getting in trouble, and she she thought to she sent me out. I grew up in Connecticut. If she sent me out to Montana, my uncle could straighten me out. Uh, so out I was shipped uh, at the beginning of summer when I was fourteen, and uh, uh, what a what a lovely man he was a minister. His ministry was partly in in the Congregational Church, uh, you know, kind of liberal Protestant. Uh, uh, he end, ended up getting fired for preaching against uh, Vietnam from the pulpit. But when I was there, uh, he, he, a lot of his ministry was on the street, too. And, um, you know, there was just a crowd of uh, uh, people we would call unhoused now or homeless. Or, but they were called uh, bums. Uh, my, my uncle went around. He brought me around us every... Monday after the big Sunday, uh, more formal ministry, he, he'd go around and find all these people in their various corners. And one of them was a guy named Kills the Sky, he called himself. He styled himself to be a, 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 to be a, a Crow Indian, but my, my uncle said he wasn't at all. And he'd known his mother, but his mother had been killed. And the kid was alone. He was my age. He had a child. He had a a girlfriend he lived with in this crummy basement apartment under a restaurant. And uh, so I became friends with him. He was something of a philosopher. My uncle, I think, saw putting us together as a way to pull me out of, to let me see what real trouble looked like and uh, to help somebody in, and thereby help myself maybe. Um, but, but, uh, Kills, as we called him, uh, was a woods. He was a, something of a philosopher, but he was also a. He's just really good in the outdoors because he'd spent so much time there. That's where he found his uh, nurture, because there was no family nurture, and 
he had the, he had this sort of game how what would we do if we were just dropped in the forest and we I told my uncle about it and he said well why don't i just drop you guys in the forest and see what happens <laughs> <laughs> and so he drove us up to the Bob Marshall Wilderness and dropped us off. And we had nothing. We had uh, uh, some fish hooks. We both uh, had, a, had a knife. Everyone had a jackknife at that time. And off we went, like two weeks just. And this kid, he knew how to find everything we needed to eat. I was good fish at fishing. That was my, uh, my contribution. But he, you know, we can eat this plant, we can eat this mushroom, we can uh, trip on these mushrooms. I mean, we managed to party no matter where we were. And after two weeks, we just walked back out to the road and uh, as instructed and hitchhiked to the nearest payphone and called my uncle and he came and got us. Um, then I think the next summer, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I uh, came back out and I went to church camp. And at church camp, I met a, uh, a girl my age, 15, and uh, that, uh, that was uh, uh, my first love in, in Montana. So Montana has this really rich uh, 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 passion for me, you know. I, uh, um, um, so, how do you write a book out of that? You know, I tried a memoir to, I've done, written really short little bits of that uh, and enjoyed doing that, but it was just not enough really there to make a whole book out of without uh, making a lot of stuff up. And if I'm gonna make stuff up, why not? I'm, I wanna write a novel. So um, uh, a character kind of emerged as I started, I said, I'll try fiction. I just started writing and uh, just wrote my way into a character who certainly wasn't Kills, but he was uh, uh, a kind of way of redeeming Kills, this guy, because Kills was um, uh, beaten to death in a bar fight some years later. My uncle wrote me and told me, uh, you know, we used to get letters. And, and uh, I was so uh, disturbed by that. I wanted, I wanted him to be who he could have been. And I think my character, uh, Lucky Turtle, uh, helped uh, me do that. And then the first love comes in uh, too. Uh, it, it's a love that is enacted in the, in the wilderness. Uh, and my love was not just for this, this girl the next summer, but also uh, for the young man. But what did I know of, uh, uh, of uh, boys and, and their love? Um, well, I have one minute, so I'm gonna read exactly one paragraph uh, of this, uh, where the book starts. It says, for my uncle Bill, that's the dedication. Here's the very first paragraph. I am Cinder Zeller. I was born in 1980 in Watertown, Massachusetts, outside Boston. I wrote a report in fifth grade, so I know Massachusetts is an Algonquian name, meaning big little hills. I grew up there sledding the biggest of the little hills and skating on mill ponds and swimming in the lakes and rivers and the ocean with the other kids, though rarely with my sister, who was much older and mocked my love of the great outdoors, sat home reading, and I will never mention her again. I adored my father who was a cabinet maker um, or when, he, when business was bad, a roofer. He hated roofing. My mother and I did not get along. She broke my ankle once by accident, but in a rage and did not take me to the doctor. And then when I was 16, I got in trouble. There, that was fast. My actual life begins with meeting Lucky, which is why I'm hurrying. Thanks, thanks so much for having me. Great to meet everybody. Thank you, Bill. Um, and as a somebody who loves wandering through the wilderness, the Montana uh, wilderness that you described sounds really inviting to me. So finally, let's welcome 2008 Penn America Emerging Voices Fellow, Maritza Rubio. Maritza's debut, Maria Maria, is a darkly funny and imaginative collection entrancing conjuring tales of Mexican American mystics and misfits set across the tropics and mega cities of the America. Maritza has an MFA in creative writing and was a Breadloaf scholar. She is the founder of Macara Center for the Arts, a nonprofit library in her hometown of Santa, Ellen, Santa Ana, California. Macara offers free specialized library services and arts and culture programs to local communities. Maria Maria will be published on April 26th by Live Right Publishing and print of Norton. 
Welcome, Maritza. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And thanks everyone for being here and for welcoming me into this conversation. I'm zooming in from Santa Ana, California, the city where I was born and raised. We're in Orange County, which is about a 20 minute drive west of the Pacific Ocean to the Pacific Ocean and an hour drive north to downtown LA. Maria Maria is my first book and it's a collection of stories featuring all of the wild people and creatures who've populated my imagination for the past few decades. It's mostly set in an alternative reality, Southern California. And some of my characters are tourists who travel to fictional Mexican beach towns to visit vampire museums, Brazilian parks for burial rituals, or they dip in and out of multiverses. I started writing most of these stories in my MFA program. It was a low residency program through Queens University of Charlotte and our residencies took place every summer in rotating South American cities, Buenos Aires, Rio, and Santiago. I'm of Mexican descent and I grew up speaking Spanish. My city is predominantly Mexican. So I was lucky enough to have that aspect of my identity consistently affirmed. My neighbors and my classmates, <clears throat> excuse me, my neighbors and my classmates all look like me. We shared cultural touchstones, languages, traditions, my family had a massive avocado tree with a tree house, lots of pets. Santa Ana is a pretty dense city and we were always surrounded by the smell of our neighbors' cookouts, street vendors, all sorts of hummingbirds and emerald parrots everywhere. So when I was in South America, I felt like it was in a foreign enough environment that I could still be wowed and enchanted, but it was also familiar enough that I didn't feel totally lost. And it was that tension that helped keep me open and observant. And I think that those environments are pretty present in these stories. I graduated in 2016 and I knew I didn't wanna teach. Um, I'm not a very good student, academia isn't for me, but I knew that I wanted to be a part of the cultural conversation somehow. I'd worked in nonprofits in some capacity since I was a teen. And one of my first real jobs was working at a specialized fashion library at a local arts college. And I loved it. It was about the size of a two car garage and just packed full of these incredible books on textiles and fashion history and designer biographies and whatever else the visiting designers wanted our students to be inspired by. One of my favorite student projects was when we had a visiting costume designer from Cirque du Soleil, and she directed the students to create acrobatic costumes based off the tarot cards of Salvador Dali. And this was in the early 2000s, so the only version of those cards that were available were this like decadent gilded version, and we had to keep it in a glass case next to a collection of vintage paper dolls. And I just love that kind of unexpected resource that you can find in libraries. And I wanted that for my hometown. Uh, so when I graduated in 2016, I founded Makara Center for the Arts, nonprofit lending library and community arts center. Santa Ana only has one full service public library for over 350,000 residents. And I knew we couldn't offer the range of services that a public library offers. So we instead focused on building a collection of, of books by writers of color and narratives by other historically excluded communities. And we really wanted Makara to be a welcoming place for all people, especially for people who felt like they didn't belong. And we painted the walls green with these giant Monstera stencils. I mean, it's it's eerie how from like how much it looks like the cover of my book. Um, and we started filling shelves with all of the donated books um, from community members and really generous publishers. And once we opened our doors, we started hosting book clubs, yoga classes, writing workshops, art shows, music performances. And we also hosted letter writing campaigns for political prisoners and a monthly tarot discussion group called Tarot and Tea. We started out as a community driven lending library. And by the time we closed in 2020 due to the pandemic, we were known locally as a nonprofit for witches and anarchists, which just somehow seems to make sense. Um, and it was the process of running Makara that really was the key to completing this collection. In 2018, we hosted Frank and Read, which is a year long citywide reading initiative celebrating the 200th anniversary of Frankenstein. And we spent all of, of all of 2018 giving away copies of the book, like 200, 300 copies of the book to local communities in Spanish and Vietnamese, graphic novels, young adult adaptations. And we had different programs related to Frankenstein, Mary Shelley, and bold artists and creators. 
And again, like I was never a good student. So I didn't read Frankenstein until a couple of years before launch, launching the program. And when I read the book, there was this one line that just stuck with me. It was just this odd line, throwaway line. And it's when the creature asks Dr. Frankenstein to make him a mate. And he declares that with his bride, he will go to the wilds of South America and never to be seen again. And I just really fixated on that. And I love thinking about how the tropics could physically affect a reanimated corpse and all that heat and humidity, the predators, the rotten fruit, like all of that, just like, oh. But it was also that line that resonated with me for totally different personal reasons. Um, when I was in Brazil for one of my residencies, my husband and I were newlyweds and we had traveled to Bahia in Northeast Brazil for our honeymoon. On our first full day there, we were out eating lunch and I ordered this big plate of shrimp with like eyes and legs just dangling all over the place. And my husband makes his face like, like, how could you eat that? It's 11 a.m. And, you know, he starts rolling his eyes and I think he's being all dramatic and he slumps over in his chair. And when he doesn't respond, when I call his name, I realize something's wrong. So I start screaming and a very calm Argentine who also happens to be a doctor comes over and he helped my husband regain consciousness. I and mean, he was dehydrated, he fainted, everything was okay. But in those moments, um, I was in a total state of shock. I really believed that I saw my husband die and come back to life. And it was like this egg of intense emotion. It's like the humidity, the proximity to death, just not knowing what was real and what wasn't. And it really was with me while we were presenting all these Frankenstein programs and talking about these, you know, life after death and creation and what 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 is possible so while i was revising this collection all of these experiences just like mixed together and clicked and the stories in this collection i believe are rooted in that place of deep love that's respectful but not afraid of death and i think it's that love that keeps these stories hopeful so no matter how many decapitations or buried bones you're going to find in the pages, these are stories about love and its otherworldly possibilities. And I really hope that people will enjoy reading them as much as I enjoyed writing them. Thank you. Thank you, Maritska. Um, the worlds you created are so immersive. And they're so wonderful. And the Makara Library just sounds Absolutely fantastic and a wonderful place to visit. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A, so I'm gonna ask the authors to all turn on their cameras and unmute themselves. And starting with Eli, um, since this is a book for every reader, can you tell us what you're reading right now or what you're looking forward to reading? Yes, yeah, so I was actually, I'm just finishing up the Department of Rare Books and Special Collections, which is kind of a perfect deal for this, by Eva, and I don't want to pronounce, mispronounce her last name. Um, she's a Canadian author. Um, and just a really great book about libraries. Uh, she's a librarian, I think, in Montreal. Um, and it was really, I mean, it opened my eyes to all of the, the she's at a university library. so money and donors and things like that i think it was it was crazy uh interesting to me um so just finishing that one up and i've actually been just like fun stuff i've been hitting lately has been uh anthony horowitz and like the magpie murders and uh those those mysteries I, i've just really gotten into those in the last month or so great magpie murders are a favorite of mine um, Elodie, what have you been reading or what are you looking so, forward to? Um, I've just read Electra by Jennifer Saint. She wrote Ariadne, which has been out in the States. Um, so I read, read a proof of that, um, or a galley, sorry, as, as you say in the States. And that was just phenomenal. She's taken a really famous um, myth of uh, Clytemnestra and, um, you know, Helen of Troy, and she's turned it into something so original, it just feels incredibly fresh. So I absolutely love that. Um, and then books that I'm looking forward to, well, I'm looking forward to the books that um, everybody's been talking about, to be honest. Um, yeah, just that really hit me hard, what you were saying about Maria Maria. Um, fascinating, so yeah. Great. 
And Bill, how about you? What will you be taking to Montana with you? <laughs> well, I want to bring the Pompeii book to Montana because, uh, you know, that uh, I, I was so uh, dazzled by that. Did you go to Ercolano uh, at all? Um, so I actually didn't manage to go to um, Herculaneum, sadly. I'm going back, so I'll go then. I was meant to, because it was a really brief trip when I was writing. Uh, well, not that brief, but, you know, like two or three days. And um, yeah, it was before COVID. So I thought I could just pop back because obviously Italy and uh, the UK are pretty close. It's only just an hour's flight. And then obviously everything shut down. <laughs> so I haven't yeah. been able to go back. <laughs> They're, yeah. they're really, uh, it's, they're so different in a way, you know, yeah. so, that was great. Anyway, so I want to read that. I want to read Eli's book. I want to read uh, Marius book, uh, real, uh, did I say your name right? Uh, Maritza's book. And um, so that, uh, that'll that keep me going for quite a while. But um, what I'm reading right now is uh, Lily King's Five Tuesdays in Winter, which is short stories. I always loved her novels. So um just I, I, stories all interest me, you know, as a, um, they're, they're better at nap time. You know, you can just, you can, <laughs> you can get a whole story in before you crash. Um, the other thing I've been reading, this is an older book, but she's got a new book out that I'm looking forward to. I haven't read it yet, but this astonished me by Maggie Shipstead. I just think she's so, um, uh, this was her first book, but just about ballet dancers. And it kind of reminds me of the discussion of the regular lives of sex workers, not that ballet, not that there's a direct comparison, just that um, she gets behind the scenes of a, of a pretty difficult life, you know? So I love that book um, lots and was able to share that with my daughter, who's a dancer. And um, it opened up a discussion that we hadn't had yet when she was 16, she's now 21, but uh, about the struggle of, of art, you know, instead of just the tutus, you know, so that was, I love that book very much. And I'm looking forward, to, uh, I, I like following authors through their careers. So I'm looking forward to the next thing. Uh, that's all, and, and billions, my, if I could turn my computer, just stacks of books every place. And it's just the most desperate situation because how many books do I have left in me? You know what I'm saying? Okay, sorry, thank you. Thank you. Um, and Maritza, besides Frankenstein, what are you <laughs> enjoying these days? You know, I just wrapped, that, wrapped up reading Cultish by Amanda Montel, The Language of Fanaticism. And I loved reading it. It just really analyzes how language is used to create these followers and these cult movements and it's just really incredibly well written and just really um the power of language which we are all really aware of but in when it's used for sinister means um, it's just very fascinating um i work at a performing arts center my day job and i someone recommended bigotry on broadway it's a collection of essays by, uh, edited by ishmael reed which i'm really excited to start reading and getting into great um so many great titles to add to everyone's to be read lists um, so again, a big thank you to Eli, Elodie, Bill, and Maritz for joining us today. And now to the publishers for a lightning speed book buzz. Take it away, Annie. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Jennifer and our wonderful authors. This is going to be the fastest book buzz in the land. Um, so my first book, also obviously get in touch if you want anything, I'll try to send you stuff if I have it. My first book up is The Wonders, which won this really prestigious award for book of the year in Spain, where it was originally published. So this is in translation. It just got a starred Kirkus Review today, which, which I found about today, which is exciting. And it follows the lives of these two women who are related, different points in time. At, um, but the whole book happens during the Women's March in Madrid in 2018. So it traces women's roles and opportunities from the 60s to the present day, their roles in motherhood, marriage, money, sex, education, but fantastic writing. Um, next up is Lonely in the Castle in the Mirror, which deals with, uh, it's fantasy, but it deals with a lot of mental health in youth, especially in Japan, which is not really something that talked about a lot, but it's about these teens and they're all feeling anxiety and depression and they touch the mirror in their bedroom and they're whisked away to this castle. So it's like Grimm's fairy tale, 
Tales of Narnia. Um, it was a number one Japanese bestseller. Next up, we've got Metropolis by librarian Fave B.A. Shapiro, author of The Art Forger. Um, this takes place in a um, in Metropolis, which is a storage facility in Boston. Um, and so it's the stories of all these different narratives of all these different characters and how they are entwined and how their stories connect um, sort of a they're not a direct mystery, it's not like a typical mystery, but it's definitely a suspenseful kind of mysterious element throughout the book. The next book up is The Stone Road, which is by award-winning Australian author Trent Jameson about a young girl who lives in this very dusty town. And on the day that she was born, this mysterious force called the Furnace also came to town. Um, and anybody who's called by this furnace is disappears and never to be heard from again. And that's what's happened to her. Uh, father, so her grandmother has raised her, and so this is about a relationship between a grandmother and a granddaughter, powerful women, magic, um, but about hope and belonging also. Next up is Jackie and Me by Louis Bayard, author of According to Mr. Lincoln and the Pale Blue Eye. It focuses on the friendship between a young Jackie before she's married Kennedy and one of Jack Kennedy's best friends. Um, it's going to be a super fun beach read for the summer. Can't wait to get into this one. Next up, we have The Poet's House. Carla is in her 20s and she's working um, in a house uh, that's owned by this woman who was the muse for a poet. And she, this muse has held on to this poet's writings and everybody wants to get their hands on them. Um, so that's sort of the crux of this book. Um, but it's also about this young woman's calling to be part of this community of amazing artists and she just loves the discussions that they have and she wants to be in their salons and how she's learning to be an artist herself and what she's coming into um, definitely will resonate for readers of Lily King's Writers and Lovers. Um, so Bill, I can send you this if you want. Um, and then next up we have Calling for a Blanket Dance, which I am so excited about. Uh, it's a debut novel, an own voices story about this young man. It's heartbreaking and honest and uplifting. It's moving. It's about this Native American man finding strength in his familial identity. Cannot wait to share this book with people. It's available as an e-galley now, so please look into it. And finally, we have Kalina, the soothsayer. Kalina is of a family that has this amazing ability to predict the future, but she does not have this gift, and so she uses her wits to like figure out her life. Um, and then she gets kidnapped by powers that be that want to take advantage of her and she has to figure out how she can get out of that situation. And that's it for me, so many things. Thank you. Um, Annie, that was impressive as always. <laughs> Just, you covered so many books and so well. Okay, so hi everyone. I am from Soho Press, uh, it's Alexa Waco here. Um, and really quick intro on Soho Press, if you don't know us, we have three imprints. So Crime, probably our largest, uh, which is publishing Don't Know Tough by Eli Craner, who you've already heard from. Soho Teen, which publishes YA fiction, and then Soho Press, which does literary adult fiction. And I'm gonna talk about one book from each so we can uh, scooch ahead, Colta. Here. Okay, awesome. First of all, Kara Black. This is the 20th installment of the New York Times bestselling series uh, that features Parisian private detective Amy LeDuc. So some of you may be familiar with Kara. I'm not going to go too deep into the plot because if you're familiar with Kara, you already probably have this on your radar, or if not, hopefully you just put it on your radar. Um, in this installment, Amy LeDuc um, is not only kind of dealing with the anniversary of her father's death and um, her daughter's, that uh, coincides with her daughter's third birthday, which if you know the series, um, Kara does really well integrating this Amy's personal life and kind of personal narrative into these really compelling uh, pulse, pounding, pulse pounding mysteries that she deals with. Um, but when a, a gathering and her daughter's birthday is interrupted when a bomb goes off the police lab um, and Boris VR, the partner of Amy's friend Michou, is found unconscious at the scene of the crime with traces of explosive, explosives under his fingernails. Amy decides that she must act to prove Boris not guilty, which she feels in her heart he is not. Um, for those of you familiar with the series, you'll know that each one takes place in a different arrondissement and apologies for butchering the French, which I surely am. Uh, this one, she navigates the streets of Tehran sur Seine, trying to learn the truth. And at the same time that she's navigating this kind of pressure with Chloe, her daughter's biological father, to leave Paris for good and move them out to his farm in Brittany. Um, 
if you can jump into the series at any time, if you're looking for an excellent, again, pulse pounding uh, thriller in the streets of Paris, some of you may be familiar with Kara from her recent best-selling standalone, her very first three hours in Paris, which is set in World War II. So if you're looking to dip into her other, uh, ser- into her series, please check out Murder at the Port de, Port de Versailles. And again, apologies for butchering the French and we can, we can uh, move on. The next one, Color of the Sky is the Shape of the Heart. This actually this reminds me of, uh, seems like a lot like the one that Annie uh, pitched. Um, it is also a Japanese translation that features teens. Um, this one is this one is really, I'm really excited about it, um, specifically because this is in translation for the first time. It wasn't originally, it was originally published in Japanese. It, it broke literary ground in Japan in addition to just winning a bunch of really prestigious awards, but specifically it got a lot of notoriety for its exploration of diaspora prejudice and the complexity of this teen girl's experience growing up as Korean in Japan. So it is written by a Korean Japanese author, Chase Sill, and uh, translated beautifully by um, Takami Nieda, who is the translator of Go. Um, so the translation is gorgeous. You can't see it, obviously, because, you know, it's you only see the PowerPoint, but it's a really slim novel that packs a punch. I don't have time, so I can't really get into the in- intricacies of it, but it is framed as Ginny, the main character's diary. She, in the beginning of the book, she has ended up in Oregon with a foster mother, a pseudo foster mother, and the book pieces together the events that transpired in her native Japan that brought her to this place. So it's such a moving depiction, again, of growing up Korean in Japan and the prejudices she faced and kind of the events that she faced while also just kind of universally being a great YA read for its depiction of just searching for a place to belong. So that is the color of the sky as a shape of the heart. Then really quickly, our last one is a Soho Press title, but there's a lot of Soho crime crossover here for people looking for really literary noir. After the lights go out, it's a harrowing and spellbinding story about family and the complications of mixed race relationships, as well as the price athletes pay to entertain. So we have a little theme with Soho going on here. Um, from the critically acclaimed author of Three Fifths, that is John Bircher, who we're really excited to bring into the Soho Press fold. It follows Xavier Scarecrow Wallace, who is a mixed race MMA fighter, who is kind of fighting for his career as well he is he is fighting chronic traumatic encephalopathy and also known as pugilistic dementia um he has also recently uh had to put his father in a home because of his father's own dementia um his father is white and the dementia has brought up the more unsavory aspects of his of his personality which is that you know kind of this latent racism that uh is really directed towards Xavier. So it is a heavy story, um, but again, really great for fans of literary noir, fans of Paul Beatty, Matthew Thomas and Leonard Garner, especially. And we do hope you'll check it out. It is another excellent kind of slim novel that packs a huge punch and it's set in Philly. So anyone looking for books that are set in Philly or urban noir, please check this one out. And then just really quickly, lastly, I wanted to put, don't know tough up on the screen in case you know so you can see that beautiful cover and just give another last shout out to Eli and thank you all for kind of joining us today. Thank you. Okay, hi everybody. I'm just uh, getting my camera turned on. Didn't want to start for me. Okay, here we go. Hi everybody. I'm Golda from Norton. Thank you so much for joining us today. And here are some highlights from our summer list. Fly Girl is the memoir that Anne Hood's fans have been waiting for. Anne grew up in a small town and getting a job as a flight attendant was her way to see the world. She worked for TWA in the late 70s and early 80s when there was still some glamour to flying, but there was also a lot of change. She reveals how the job empowered her despite its roots in sexist standards. Packed with funny, moving, and surprising stories of life as a flight attendant, Fly Girl captures the nostalgia and magic of air travel at its height. The Immortal King Rao by Vahini Vara is a debut literary novel with elements of speculative and dystopian fiction. The story is narrated by Athena Rao, who is sitting in a prison cell. She has grown up in a world where governments have been replaced by corporations. People are no longer citizens, they are shareholders, and their worth is determined by their social capital. It turns out that it was her father, King Rao, who created the technology that led to this. Athena tells his story from growing up on a coconut grove in India to moving to the USA for grad school, 
and then his advances in computers and technology. But why is Athena in prison? And what happened to King Rao? You gotta read the book to find out. France by Graham Robb is for all your Francophiles out there. Graham Robb blends history, travelogue, portraits of important personalities, and his own experiences of living and traveling in France in this history full of charming anecdotes and beautiful landscapes. The Colony is a true crime investigation into the murder of nine fundamentalist Mormons in 2019. The best-selling investigative journalist Sally Dutton picks up where initial reporting on the killings left off and in the process tells the violent history of the Le Baron clan and their homestead. Big Girl by Mecca Jamila Sullivan is a debut Own Voices novel set in Harlem in the 90s. The novel explores food addiction and diet culture with nuance and levity, interrogating the intellectual, emotional, and bodily lives of young Black women contending with disordered eating. Mecca Jamila Sullivan was just on a book list Authors and Arcs webinar yesterday, and the recording of that should be available soon if you want to go back and watch it. The Metaverse is the first book on the next big thing. Matthew Ball explains what the Metaverse is and how it is poised to revolutionize every industry and function, whether we like it or not. The Maker of Swans is an atmospheric historical mystery by the author of The House on Vesper Sands, which was a Library Reads pick last year. And Vera Kelly Lost and Found is the third and final book in the Vera Kelly series. In this one, Vera and her girlfriend Max travel to Southern California to see Max's family, but then Max disappears. This is Vera's most personal and high stakes investigation yet. And Death and the Conjurer by Tom Mead is from Mysterious Press. Set in 1930s London, the magician turned sleuth Joseph Spector has to solve multiple locked room murders that seem impossible, but might just be connected to each other. So of course we have a bunch more titles coming out from Norton and our client publishers this spring and summer. And I will talk about many of these in future webinars. And you can also find our complete catalog on Edelweiss. Thank you again for listening. And now I'll turn it over to Chris. Thank you very much, Golda. Hello again. I am still Chris Vicari of Union Square and Company, formerly Sterling Publishing. Thanks for joining us on this afternoon where we announce in addition to our company name change that we are publishing a curated list of fiction starting in March 22 with, next slide please, Golda, The Wolf Den by Elodie Harper. Elodie just spoke here about her new book, the first in a trilogy of novels about a woman named Amara her life and the lives of women in the notorious brothel in Pompeii known as the Wolf Den, the recent number one London Times bestseller from start to finish. It is emotional and unflinching, but also resilient and grossing and a story of finding love and strength in one another. Some readers said perfect for fans of Madeline Miller's Circe looking for historical fiction. Please request from us on NetGalley, Edelweiss, or even a print arc and your wish will be granted. Keep it in mind for upcoming Library Reads nominations. I do hope you can find the time to read it. Book two in the trilogy, The House with the Golden Door will follow this fall. Next up, next slide is rest rituals. You can raise your hand at home if you are sleep deprived. I know I can be as recently as last night, but this book rest rituals with its guided meditations and visualizations as well as self-hypnosis, gentle movement, and breathwork technique is exactly what I need and perhaps some of your patrons need to get the kind of sleep they need to maximize clarity, energy, and excitement for any day ahead. Next slide is mushroom magic. The question for everyone is why is everyone so obsessed with mushrooms right now? Well, they are packed with nutrients. That's one reason. They have a low environmental impact, but they also serve as a signifier of the mystery of the forest and an emblem of your cottage core dreams. Our book has the feel for the fungi with candid profiles of 22 well-known mushrooms, then a global collection of mushroom myths and fables. Lastly, spells and rituals, plus some yummy meals that can improve your love life supercharge your good fortune, or even cast a hex. The days of underappreciating friendly fungi will soon be behind us. Next is Knit Shawls, 
25 patterns for a range of skill levels using those world famous Noro yarns, which spin into unique, colorful patterns that self stripe. Yes, they self stripe. So you can create a feast for the eyes and body. Shawls are one of the hottest knitting projects today because they don't require a precise fit for successful execution, making them satisfying to a world full of knitters. My friends, join the Shawl Nation. Moving into fall. Next slide, please, with Union Square and Company. Meet author Molly Gilbert. She's the founder of the food blog, Duncan Crumble, graduate of the French Culinary Institute and the original sheet pan queen, joining us to satisfy our sweet tooth in sheet pan sweets. 75 brand new hassle-free recipes for simple desserts made using everyone's favorite pan. Classic treats, bold new feats. There's something for everyone in sheet pan sweets. And now for something completely different on our next slide with a jacket still to come, I promise. Lastly, building our list of fiction, it is Deadly Breed publishing this fall. Those of us at my company who got an advanced read of this book all came back and said, yes, acquiring editor, please get this book because we love it. Deadly Breed is the story of a genetically enhanced laboratory rat named Sammy, whose supersized intelligence helps him to engineer his escape into the world outside the laboratory which is a world incredibly ill-equipped to deal with the present and future menace he represents. I think of it as little Jurassic Park, maybe a little Planet of the Apes, especially that line from the former saying, and all the time while you were wondering if you could create it, you didn't stop to think if you should. We will have advanced copies of Deadly Breed very soon from very talented writers, and I can't wait for you to read it. And next slide, if you have any questions about Union Square and company, please let me or my nice colleague, Andrea Gokenauer, know because we aim to please. And now on behalf of our moderator, Jennifer Winberry and Alexa at Soho, gold at W.W. Norton and the marvelous Annie Mays is at work, man. I say those are the books and that's the way it is on this day in 2022. We thank you all so much for joining us here today. Please stay healthy, stay well, and we hope to see you again in person one day very soon, very soon. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>